You've survived assassinations and been the target of terrorist bombings. Not very common for an economist. Talk to me about whether or not you're still facing repercussions that you once were. No, that's over. Uh, what happened is that uh, during the 80s and early 90s, uh, Peru was the victim of a very strong uh, terrorist movement called the Shining Path. And uh, we brought out a series of documents. I wrote a book called The Other Path, the purpose of which was to indicate that there was another solution to poverty that didn't go down the Marxist-Leninist uh, route. And the result of that was that they decided to punish us. So we also were uh, involved in reforms. We designed a lot of reforms. Uh, we've done over 178 uh, legal reforms, substantial ones in Peru, that refer to property rights, that refer to democracy, that refer to constitutional provisions for freedom. And of course, that angered them more. And that uh, resulted in more bombs and uh, more shooting. But that was uh, what the, the game was about. Possibly, if we hadn't been shot at, it would have been an indication that we weren't having an impact. We had an impact. You named your book, as you mentioned, The Other Path, which was clearly in direct defiance to the terrorist organization. Tell me why you did that and if you were fearful. In Peru, uh, everybody talked about Sendero, the path, instead of the shining path. We cut it short, uh, saying the other path indicated you had an alternative to them. And obviously, that was going to get you readers. And then you at least were going to be read, and people would say, uh, thumbs up or thumbs down. And you were fine there. Now, I understood that there were risks. And so I did hesitate very much before finally going to print. There was actually a moment which I decided not to do it. I remember uh, the birds were chirping and I said, I might never see, hear them again and I might never see nature again. Oh, this is ridiculous, let's not do it. And then I felt much better for about three days. Then I started feeling like a coward and I said, the book was written for the title. It wasn't only a book that had a title to it. The book was written for the title. There was no way of getting out of it. So some nice people gave me a uh, bulletproof car I started learning about security, and uh, we were sort of hunted around for about five years. And then peace came. We actually had something to do with that, and everything was fine. And uh, interesting thing about human nature is you learn to live in all these different conditions and get along. How important do you think democracy is? Democracy is crucial uh, because it is the government by the people and for the people. And it means that you have to find consensuses. You've got to learn to live with your neighbors. And democracy is the facilitation of that through law. Uh, however, it's a very refined and complex system. We don't really fully understand everything that is involved. So your democracy is a mature democracy. It's an effective democracy compared to ours. And I mean ours most of the third world where democracy, to a great degree, stops with just elections. And you have that in many countries. You've got, uh, uh, it just takes different forms. The Swiss have something called Bernheim Lassum, whereby before the rules come out, they circulate among at least 3,000 civic groups. So they're vetted, they're analyzed. Uh, they are min minutiously looked at to, in effect, find out if the rule responds to people's needs, their criteria, their culture, and they are not simply being manipulated. They have referendums so that if you don't like the rule that elected government is giving you, you can come out and propose alternative rules. The reason we started looking at this, of course, was because when the Shining Path was uh, a vigorous movement in Peru, uh, their arguments were democracy doesn't work in our culture. We need a new type of government. And so we had to find out if they were right or if what happened is that we weren't really applying the model in its entirety. And so we were able then to bring back to the shining path the argument that is, yes, we're an imperfect democracy, but nevertheless, we're on our way there. You're proposing something that isn't even that. You're even proposing no elections whatsoever. So at least we're halfway there. You're proposing something that is a dictatorship. So we were able to bring out quality arguments 
to explain that it isn't that we Latin Americans don't like democracy, but we just haven't set it up correctly. And the fact that Americans aren't telling us that we haven't ha don't have it really that complete doesn't mean that they know everything. Why should they? Yeah. So it's up to us to actually be able to define democracy better. Mm -hmm. And you discussed the time loss in an informal economy. Talk to me about capital lost. What is dead capital? Well, dead capital is when whatever you own is only the physical value of what you own. In other words, in the United States, you own a house. Mm -hmm. But you can do a whole bunch of things with a house. That house, first of all, is a point on the map. It's an address, mm -hmm. which tells the electricity company that's, or that's distributing the electricity that they not only know where your house is, it's a terminal for their wire, but it's also the place that is owned by somebody who's responsible for paying the bills. Therefore, the electrical company will come and give you the electricity because they know that they can collect. The biggest problems about distributing electricity or clean water is not whether uh, you know where to go. The real problem is, are they going to pay for it? Right. And when it comes to clean water, they, won't also, they also won't go because collecting is so difficult. So actually, if you're informal, you won't have, therefore, the tubes bringing in the clean water or the sewage coming out. You'll have to buy the water from uh, tanks, uh, trucks with tanks on them. That'll cost you six times more than if you had a tube. And all of that because you didn't have an address. And you don't have an address because your property is not legal. So, the cons so if you start having a house, all of a sudden utilities start working for you. The price of electricity goes down. The price of water goes down. And at the same time, since you don't have to go to town meetings and get together with everybody so that if somebody ever wants to evict you, you're strong, you're talking about 10,000 people, 20,000, maybe a million, and you just won't take it anymore. Uh, to do that, you've got to be politically active. That takes an awful lot of time. So there you are, a lot of dead capital, meaning that your house, instead of giving you more income, giving you more comfort, actually takes away time, takes away comfort, and everything is more expensive. One of the principal uh, elements also, if you have an illegal home or an informal home, is that since you cannot certify that you are the owner, you therefore can't get a mortgage. And uh, you can't use it to guarantee credit the way you could if it were legal. It's not that people won't give you credit, it's that they'll make it much more expensive. Uh, at the same time, uh, you can't use it as a contribution for capital. Um, and so you're not able to use it to make an investment. Some people will say, I'll give as a guarantee for the shares that I need in this company, my home. And at the same time, of course, from the point of view of government, uh, since they don't know who really is in the house, they don't know if Osama bin Laden or Abimael Guzman or an agent of Fidel Castro is in the house. You also, can't, the police can't work without addresses. If you look at any of your police films in the United States, they're going from one address to another address to another address until they catch the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to get that if you don't have property rights, because property rights are the precursor to addresses. So that is dead capital. In other words, the fact that you're legal puts so much information on paper, on documents, on records, that is fed to other people, that gives them security, that all sorts of good things start happening. So dead capital is all of that value, that surplus value that is additional to the bricks, the mortar, the iron that's in your house, which you're not getting. How do you think that property rights correlate with human rights, with basic human rights? Well, I think property rights are a human right. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's somebody, something that not many people look at. Uh, Article 17 says everybody has a right to property. And uh, we, as a matter of fact, set up within the United Nations system a commission for the legal empowerment of the poor, the purpose of which was to give substance to that Article 17. And we brought a report that was accepted by the General Assembly of the United Nations and is now on its way to be implemented, among other organizations by the United Nations, the United Nations Development Program. It is a commission that I co-chaired with Madeleine Albright, and it's on its, uh, its way there, and establishing property rights as a human right. If you don't give people property rights, 
you're depriving them of a lot of the fruits of their labor. It's important to know that. In other words, let's discuss whether those property rights should be uh, those that allow you to damage the environment. We can discuss that. We can discuss whether those property rights should be absolute. We can discuss whether those property rights should be forever. Should you get fee simple, which is that that house is yours and for generations to come? Should it be constrained by eminent domain in case they want to drive a road through your property and should you be adequately compensated? We can discuss all of those things. But if you don't give somebody a defined rule as to how they can use the things that they possess, you are in effect depriving them of an enormous part of the value that those things should have, which happen to be the things that have given your country and Western countries so much wealth. That's the story behind it. Sometimes you wish you could withdraw the word property rights because it can be sometimes so conflictive. It can, it can, be, uh, it, it can sound like uh, you're talking about wealth to only the rich, but I can't find any other word for it because that happens to be the word humanity has used to having legal rights to control assets. Well, you've fought for human rights and you've defeated guns and violence with ideas and words. What do you say to scientists, economists, or ordinary citizens that are living under totalitarian governments that are willing to imprison them for speaking their minds? Well, first of all, I feel extremely uh, privileged to be able to talk to people who are doing, as far as I'm concerned, uh, God's work, uh, thinking about humankind and the fact that uh, we do have some basic rights on which we can all agree. And uh, it takes courage to do that, and it takes selflessness. So I'm uh, sorry I'm not among you. I wish I were, but uh, I am with you in, uh, in spirit. Uh, regarding what I do, it's just simply try and add to the human rights agenda uh, additional instruments that I think may be useful. Thinking of the fact that the poor aren't only poor, they're also entrepreneurs. They also put things together, they combine things, they make a living. They're not necessarily employees of anybody. And to do that, they need uh, tools that uh, allow them to get organized. Obviously, they have assets. They own animals, they own machinery, they own houses. No matter how uh, humble they are, they own land, but they don't have a good legal property right on it. And as I indicated before, not having it means that the value of their assets are extremely low. If you have a title to your home, you can sell it for twice or three times the price. If you don't have title to your home, you're buying uncertainty. So the value of your assets comes down. If you have title to a house, you can get credit, you can get investment, you can get utilities, all sorts of good things actually happen. So it's important to think of them also as homeowners and to think of them as people who want to get wealthier, even if relatively so. And it's important to also understand that doing business doesn't just mean moving one thing from one place to the other. If you don't have a legal organization, the tools with which to get organized, it actually doesn't work as well. If you have a business without limited liability, which is a legal condition, that means you work with unlimited liability. Most corporations, most businesses in Western Europe and the United States have limited liability, which means that they can set a limit to how liable they are should they fail at their business. All the poor in the world do business, but they have no unlimited liability. They don't have the right to issue shares. How can you get anybody to invest in your business, whether it's $10 or $30 or $100 or $10,000 or $100,000, how will anybody invest in your business if you can't give them a share, part of the equity, against it? And yet the poor don't have the business enterprises with which to be able to issue shares. So they can't get credit, they can't get investment, and they have unlimited liability, which means that they run all the risks of the world. And sometimes they don't have a business organization to run the businesses. I mean, in the United States and in Western Europe, your family is one thing, your political party is one thing, your religion is another thing, but you've got a special entity with a special hierarchy to run business separately and still take into consideration family interests. But it's not the same structure, the business structure, 
than the one of the religion of the home. And that was realized very early on by the Europeans in the 19th century when they understood that the enterprise, the legal enterprise, the company, the corporation, had to be not only the privilege of the very rich, but it had to be accessible to everybody without the king or government deciding whether one person deserves it or not. That was a huge revolution when it occurred. Now, those things are not working today in developing countries, and it's important to think of the poor not only as workers, as proletarians, as underdogs, but as people that also have a potential to create their own wealth. And that is done, generally speaking, through law. It's about rules. And that is a human right as well, because uh, when it does happen, it works wonders, as you Westerners know very well. Thank you for listening to me or listening to this interview.